All right, so last time we discussed divine illumination, the divine illumination theory. And that was basically the theory that God is the principle of all rational judgment. God is the principle of judgment. He's not the content of thought. In other words, you don't have like a substantial awareness. And one of the things we kind of connected that to was like the cart with the chiliagon, the thousand-sided figure. You can't really imagine a thousand-sided figure, but you can make correct judgments about it. Well, God is basically the, the principle of judgment. And this principle of judgment allows you to get to any truth claim and any universal claim. At least this was the claim of divine illumination. And it also got us out of the problem of the mind-reality disconnect. Like just how exactly can our minds and our concepts refer to reality? And this was one of the ways. By denying that all our thoughts are internal, but rather we have some sight of the mind to God himself, at least as a principle of judgment. So today we're going to talk about the ontological argument again. So this was like the second presentation I think we did here, and we'll recap that a bit because that was a pretty basic understanding of the ontological argument, and this time we were going to deal with Kant. So you have Guanilo, you have that monk who ref tried to refute Anselm, you have Thomas Aquinas, you have Hume, you even have criticisms by the typical average person these days when they hear the argument, but nothing stands in comparison to Kant's criticisms. Nothing is more popular than Kant's criticisms, nothing is considered in the academia more devastating to the ontological argument than Kant's criticisms. So by pairing the ontological argument against Kant, the idea is that this will be the best fire that you can refine the ontological argument with by placing it against this most famous of criticisms. It's not just one criticism, but they are several. And I'm getting these from the critique of pure reason from Kant. So let's just review a minute the ontological argument itself. And we'll, this is, you'll recognize some of these slides from last time. But the ontological argument is called a reductio ad absurdum. And this is a type of geometric uh, proof oftentimes to prove axioms in geometry and mathematics. You basically assume the opposite of what you're trying to show as true, and you see if a contradiction comes out of it. <clears throat> basically, you assume something, and you see if something logically follows that's absolutely absurd. Because if it's absurd, it can't be true. And if everything that you use to get to that conclusion was true, it means that the assumption has to be false by logic. And so this is the type of argument that Anselm presents here. So A there is for the assumption. So the assumption is that in which none greater can be conceived does not exist in reality. And before we move on, let's take a look at that in which none greater can be conceived. So this is what Anselm would say many people will call God. Anselm doesn't really care if you want to call that God or whatever you want to call it. He's simply intending to prove that this thing exists, that in which none greater can be conceived. Now, you can see why people would call this God. You can see why people would see this as synonymous with God, especially in the Christian Judeo context where the meaning of God is the I am who am or being itself. And if it's that, then which none greater can be conceived, obviously it's infinite. Obviously it means truth itself because truth is that which is. And the opposite of which is 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 not. And a finite thing, uh, too, when it comes to the infinity, a finite thing is something that is not in some way, that's limited in some way. And uh, other things, beauty itself, goodness itself. So that in which none greater can be conceived, you can see why Anselm would refer to that as God. So Anselm says, let's assume that that in which none greater can be conceived does not exist in reality. And Anselm will go on to say, well, that in which none greater can be conceived does exist in the mind. He said, even... Even the person who denies that God exists or that in which none greater can be conceived exists in reality, even they are thinking of something in order to deny it. So he says that in which none greater can be conceived exists in the mind. 
And Anson points out just a basic principle of logic that all things equal, every quality equal, it is greater to exist in reality and in the mind than in mind alone. It's simply more existence. So it is unqualifiedly greater. It's just more being, more substance. And then Anson points out, well, we could conceive of something that's identical to God, but actually exists in reality. Which means, logically following from all those premises, QED, for that in which none greater can be conceived, something greater can be conceived. <laughs> which is illogical, hence we reject the assumption. So because assuming God doesn't exist leads to a logical contradiction, then we have to reject the assumption as a matter <coughs> of logic. So common criticisms. One of the most famous common criticism is the one that he was presented to in his own lifetime by a fellow monk. This is called an overload argument. And Guanilo is the one who used it, more or less. It, it actually isn't precisely what he used. Uh, Guanilo, Guanilo's logic was a little bit poor, and he didn't actually present this. But we, we basically refer to this argument to him anyway because he was so close to getting this argument. But basically, it's the greatest conceivable island argument, or really that you can plug anything into that assumption and prove that it exists by simply calling it that X, in which none greater can be conceived. So I take an island and I say, uh, that island in which none greater can be conceived exists in reality, but, uh, or doesn't exist in reality, but it does exist in the mind. And then you just go on that same argument and then you say, well, uh, for that island in which none greater can be conceived, a greater island can be conceived, therefore it proves its existence. But obviously that's absurd because you could prove everything like that exists. Uh, we went over the response to it, Bonaventure's response. It's a contradiction in terms. It is inconceivable. It presumes that there's a finite infinite, which is a contradiction in terms. And one cannot conceive, it's not even possible, in other words, it's not even in the mind, that there is any greatest possible thing that already has limitations. And anything you can think of besides the infinite as limitations by definition. An island's a particularly good example of this with its borders. Every island has a border, and hence you can always add to it. There is no maximal island. Numbers are a similar thing. Because numbers are limited to a specific quantity, you can always add more to it. Even to an infinite <coughs> number line, which isn't truly infinite because it lacks other qualities besides numerical quantity, you can add other qualities to it, namely color, or uh, some other type of substance. So anything that's finite is necessarily finite and thus not infinite. So to claim that you could have, you could have a greatest possible island in one's mind is a contradiction in terms and impossible. It's a four-sided triangle. It's not conceivable. Other criticism we went over was that God doesn't exist in the mind. Maybe God's like that island, right? Maybe in the very concept of the meaning of God. And we went uh, possible responses to that. Actually, I think the criticism we dealt with there primarily was the claim that we don't know God fully. And so how can we say God exists in the mind? And some's answer was, well, we know God to the extent that we know that he is that than which none greater can be conceived. And that is sufficient. Actually deal with that other criticism with Kant because Kant actually makes the criticism a possibility there. Uh, also, greater is subjective. It's just your opinion that something is particularly greater in that way. So we dealt with that. What Anselm meant there was not a subjective quality of what's greater, but literally greatness itself. So if you want to say greatness is subjective, you have to understand what greatness means in the first place. Greater simply means more. When you're dealing with mathematical equation and you do something like one is greater than two, that's absolutely not subjective at all. It simply means one has more. And Anselm, when he's talking about greater here, is simply meaning one has more existence. And so it has nothing to do with subjectivity. Finally, thinking does not mean it is true. In other words, just because you have this equation that basically proves God's existence doesn't necessarily mean that's true. 
and where criticism of that particularly was that's an argument against the conclusion, which is never a logical way to address a criticism. It, you might as well just say, nuh-uh, I don't like that. It doesn't say anything about the logic of the equation itself. So we dealt with those criticisms. And we looked at uh, which premise each one of them attacked. And we saw, of course, with that last one that it did not attack any premise. It just attacked the conclusion, which again, is not a logical way to address a logical argument. You might disagree with it, but you're just disagreeing with logic. Uh, there's not much that can be communicated beyond that point. Uh, so we saw which one of those criticisms went to which premise, and we analyzed various responses to the responses, and so on and so forth. So today we are going to deal with Kant. And Kant is a headache. If you've ever read the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant himself realized it wasn't getting enough popularity, so he produced a work fancifully titled the uh, and I'm not even going to pronounce this right, Pro prolaminga to any further metaphysics as a cheat guide to his critique of pure reason with a wonderful simple name such as that. And uh, Kant is notoriously difficult to understand and uh, interpretations are many. And because the interpretations are many, I have decided to go to the source itself, and I am taking his criticism straight out of his critique of pure reason. Because I find you often get straw men, that's weak versions of Kant's arguments, that are presented as his actual statement because they are pithy phrases that you can say, and they stick in common society, and they're actually horrible, horrible arguments against the ontological argument that do not give Kant the genius that he's due. So <laughs> these are my understandings of what Kant says. And as I say, Kant is notoriously difficult to understand, much better than some of the philosophers who follow him, like Heidegger and Hegel. And he's far more logical than they are, at least clearly logical than they are. But he is notoriously difficult to understand. If anybody's read Thomas Aquinas before, like the Summa Theologica particularly, Think of the Summa Theologica without its structure. So take away the structure from the Summa Theologica and you pretty much have Kant. The density of Thomas Aquinas without a clear structuring of the question and answer format as the scholastics were famous for. And you pretty much have Kant. And you, know, you can see how difficult he can be. As Thomas Aquinas has many different interpretations, you can imagine just how many interpretations mm -hmm. Kant might have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the the video you gave us, um, it says Kant never didn't believe in God. Uh, that uh, so the question was, uh, there's a video that I sent out that mentioned how God uh, Kant didn't believe in God. That's not actually true. If the video said that, that's wrong. I don't I don't remember that in the video. Kant was a fairly avid believer in God. He believed in natural that, that's religion. What it said. Oh, he did sorry. Believe in God, oh, so. he did believe in God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe okay. Said it incorrectly. So he's he's not attacking this argument because he believes he doesn't believe in God. Right. He's attacking it because he doesn't believe the the logic right. behind the argument. Right. 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 Uh, well. So the question is his motivations, because if Kant believes in God, why is he attacking this argument? Uh, the motivations behind Kant's argument are interesting. They won't necessarily go to the argument itself, the validity of the argument or the invalidity of the argument. Uh, but psychologically, what was motivating Kant historically? Uh, one possible thing with the motivation is Kant is very interested in promoting this idea of both natural religion of morality, and he's also very interested in separating sciences and intellectualism from religion. Now, I'll put this in context. Basically, Kant wanted us to have religion that is completely untouchable by science. He wanted religion to be transcendental in both ways. 
In other words, he wanted to try and prove that religion cannot be disproved by science, but it also can't be proven by science. He wanted to make it something, in, in some ways, a little bit of subjective uh, belief. And he wanted to make the focus on faith alone. He wanted, as a Protestant as he was, he wanted the focus to be on pure faith. You had to have pure faith in God. Also, at the same time, he's wanting morality to be separated from the question of God. In other words, he wants us to do good just for the sake of these moral principles without any question of reward and happiness that might come from it. Uh, you can see why we did that presentation before with the connection between goodness uh, and happiness and kind of some of the logical problems that arise when you separate those two. And the question of whether something making you happy makes it less good or vice versa, addressing that particular question itself. Kant wanted to separate those two things, and we also see a lot of his influence today on questions of morality, particularly along those lines. So the ontological argument for Kant posed a serious problem to his entire purpose. It also posed an, a serious problem and motive besides those to his epistemological system. If the ontological argument was true, his entire critique of pure reason, his several hundred pages of work, would be false. Because for Kant, ultimately, you cannot make a true existential claim about reality. It's stuck in the phenomena. You can't make a claim about what he calls the noumena, which is what we might call reality outside of sensory experience, outside of the perception which our brain or our mind already molds according to these uh, structures of our own thoughts. And so Kant basically wanted to say in the critique of pure reason, we are more or less stuck in the mind. And we can't really say anything outside of the mind because everything's structured already within it. And it's subjective. It's, it's structured by our particular uh, mode of thinking. One of the things he'll talk about is the a priori forms of space and time. Everything comes to us, every experience we have of sensory reality is spatial temporal. But he would say that cannot be found through the senses, thus it's found within our own structure of thinking. But since we can't think outside that, we can't really say anything about reality because we only can understand it after we've made a subjective interpretation of it. The ontological argument, especially as Descartes points out, would give us an out. It gives us an out of the mind into reality itself. And Kant does not want that or his entire system would fall apart. Next question. Okay, next question. Does the Catholic Church have a, a viewpoint, a, stand, a standing on one of these? So the question is, does the Catholic Church have a viewpoint on Kant's position and perhaps the ontological argument? No, the church does not make a stance either way on this, on this question, whether the ontological argument is valid or not, or even whether Kant's philosophy is valid or not. Mm -hmm. There's theologians and philosophers within the church on both sides. There's this group called Transcendental Thomists, which are basically Kantian Thomists. They see Kant as the logical progression of Thomas Aquinas. A famous person under this camp would be uh, Karl Rahner. Rahner is a very famous theologian in the Catholic Church, particularly in the 60s, uh, who is a famous transcendental Thomist. And he's a big fan of Kant, obviously. Kant was highly influential in the church, too. Uh, not, just, not just in Protestant circles, but within the church as well. But I would say the majority of theologians do not like Kant, but you have a, you have a portion of them who do. And the church doesn't really take a position on these particular logical arguments. Uh, so his three criticisms, and before we get into that, so Kant, he was known for being very orderly. In fact, there's legends that people in his town would set their clocks by Kant's daily activities because he was so ordered and organized and habitual. Now, this might give you the impression that Kant was kind of this 
uh, stoic, robotic type of guy. Uh, the accounts are actually quite the opposite, that he uh, was quite personable, uh, is what I hear. Uh, things are well, kind of irrelevant, I suppose. But, okay, we talked about his whole system through the questions of what his system is, what he's, what he's trying to prove. And Kant is actually not just trying to create this system arbitrarily. Kant is trying to resolve a question that has been posed by Hume, and he's trying to reconcile the interesting details that Hume has found in epistemology with continental rationalism. So you have the British Isle uh, empiricism, and you have the continental Europe is very much rationalist in, in, line, in the line of Descartes, more or less. So uh, those two systems, the British see things as the most important thing is to always look through the senses. Uh, we know things through the senses and primarily through the senses. The Continentals were primarily of the view that you look at things through the reason. And the reason is how you understand and work through things. Kant says Hume woke him up from his rationalistic dogmatic slumber. And the particular thing that Hume points out that was very interesting to Kant, and at least one of the things that he mentions, is Hume points out that you cannot, against the empiricist, against Locke, against the other British, the Scottish as he is, he points out that particular universal ideas are very problematic. A priori ideas are very problematic to the empiricist, particularly things like cause and effect. So if you're an empiricist and you say you're a blank slate and everything you learn is from the senses, where do you see cause and effect? You don't. You see a billiard ball, for example, hit another billiard ball and it moves. But nowhere do you see this thing of cause and effect. You can't touch it, you can't taste it, you can't see it. And if you could, then you can describe it in an empirical manner, but you can't. And where do you come to the conclusion, particularly things like cause and effect in any universals, that these things are going to apply over a set of experiences. If you're getting it from your experience, then no matter how many times you see it, there's absolutely no reason to think that that's going to happen again. There's nothing in the empirical data that would tell you that that exact same thing will happen again. So Hume says, oh, best we can maybe say habit or something like that. Same things with things like the past is a good determinant of the future or that the universe is order, things like that. But Kant says those things are actually meaningful. They aren't just these meaningless things that we bring to our experiences, but Kant sees that these things are meaningful. So he questions himself and he says, well, we don't get it from the outside because we don't get it from the senses. Therefore, it must come internally. It must be the a priori structures of reasoning. It's something that we inform all our thoughts by. And Kant analyzes this further and looks to all the universals which we apply to sensory data. And he looks at the most fundamental of them all being space and time. Everything comes in the mode of space and time, yet we neither see, taste, hear, or anything like that, space or time. So Kant concludes, therefore, then that must structure this raw, meaningless sensory data into spatio-temporal thoughts. Uh, and Kant moves along with this, with this rationalist. Most people will call him a rationalist. I think it's probably better. I think he falls more closely to the camp of an empiricist because he seems to think that everything comes, needs to relate to sensory data. And why make that jump, for instance, that these universals are something internal? Why just presume that the only thing we get externally is through the senses? Is quite a jump. But at any rate, we'll leave all his epistemological stuff aside and just address his criticisms to the ontological argument. So there's three criticisms that we're going to look at. He makes another one, but he himself actually rejects the criticism after making it. Uh, he says it's a pretty weak criticism when you consider some of the responses to it. Uh, that has to do with annihilating what he calls annihilating the subject and the predicate in thought. He says uh, most proponents of the ontological argument will uh, point out that it's something that when you even annihilate the thought, you're committing the contradiction. So he, he kind of casts that one aside. Uh, very weak versions of the ontological argument might fall for that one, but we won't really address that criticism. So the three criticisms 
God might be impossible. The other one is pure reason says nothing about reality, absolutely nothing on its own. Existence is not a real predicate. And then finally, we'll address a pseudo-criticism that he's famous for, but one that it doesn't really appear Kant makes. But we'll still address it anyway, since it's a popular understanding of one of his criticisms. And most people who quote Kant uh, triumphantly against the ontological argument will actually cite this kind of pseudo-criticism. So, first one we'll deal with is Kant's objection that God might be impossible. This is the idea that God might be nothing cogitatable, nothing that's actually thinkable. So remember what we just talked about, about God being in the mind. He basically says then, if God is something that's uncogitatable, if God is something that's logically impossible, then denying that he exists will not produce a contradiction. Just like that greatest island thing that we talked about. If God is meaningless, if God is contradictory like a four-sided triangle, then you can't even make sense out of the assumption that the ontological argument makes in the first place. Nor can you make the first premise that he exists in the mind. And particularly, you can't make that one. So, looking at this criticism, where do you think it would go? I mean, I kind of gave it away, but where do you think it would go in the argument here? What is he particularly addressing in this argument? Yep, yep. Or that in which none greater can be conceived exists in the mind. Well, you could also be a criticism against three there, uh, because that's also saying that something can be conceived, right? Uh, similar thing. But you know, those two things could be conceived. So we put it right there. We put it as a criticism of the first premise after the assumption. <laughs> He's basically saying, uh uh. That which none greater can be conceived does not exist in the mind. It's not a possible concept. Uh, regardless of whether you could actually think it or not, you couldn't. It, potentially, it's something that we couldn't think of. He's not, he's not necessarily saying that it is something impossible. Simply saying that one presumes way too much. How do we even know that one would be true? How do we even know that God exists in the mind? We jump to that pretty quickly because we are going to talk about the subject. But how do we really know that that's the case? And you kind of think about with a four-sided triangle. You also think about something like this, and, and this is something that would think pass by ordinary thinking. Let's say I said, uh, I can think of a unicorn in this room. But can I? Can I? And can you? When you analyze what the meaning of this is, is in that sentence, this room. Now, if this room does not include unicorns, then what you are basically saying is you can conceive of a room that has no unicorns having unicorns, which is a contradiction. Now, you can conceive of perhaps an image of a unicorn, and you can conceive of a room very much like this room. But to conceive of this room with the unicorn is actually logically impossible. And Kant would say something like that with God. How do you know things like reality and God go together and don't produce a contradiction? Again, Kant believes in God. He doesn't actually think God is necessarily impossible. He's just saying, who are you to claim that it is possible? What's the logic behind that premise? We think we're proving more than we actually are. So... Before we go into the response to that, can anybody think of a possible response to that? If you can, I would say you're a genius because it took one of the greatest mathematical geniuses, I think, to resolve this. A response to Kant or a response to... A response to Kant. So a response to the claim that God is impossible. Other, not that he is impossible, but that he could be impossible. Can you think of a proof that God is possible? I mean, for me, God is God is impossible. I, I, I don't I don't think I can imagine God. Now, 
do I imagine that God can, God is there? Yes. But I don't, I will not claim to be able to figure out God. Now, right. what, what does he mean? Does he mean, does he mean that it's just not possible to have God? Or right. it's uh, not possible to imagine right. the, the God? Right. So the question is basically, I cannot really conceive of God. I don't really have a good idea of God. Uh, so in that sense, does, is that what Kant means by impossibility? But at the same time, I would say something like, I think God is possible even if I can't conceive him. I can think God is possible even if I can't conceive him. Uh, and so what exactly does Kant mean? So you're right. A, uh, a statement like God exists in the mind definitely needs clarification. And I think a better way actually to write the argument is God is possible. You can work up the argument out the same way and replace one with a statement, God is possible, just reword some of the statements there. Or you can say, uh, God is conceivable, maybe not by me, but it's a thing which is conceivable, which really means the same thing as possible. Kant is not saying God is impossible, but that he might be impossible. In other words, he might not be something that anybody, any mind whatsoever could conceive, or rather, he might be something that is that could not exist in any possible conceivable reality. So that's what Kant means when he's talking about that he might be impossible. Kant is not saying, again, Kant is not saying God is impossible. He's not making such a bold claim. He's simply asking the question, where is your proof for this premise that God is possible? Because if we analyze the fact that we don't really have much of a thought of God, how do we know that the predicates the qualities of God are not something that are contradictory, like a four-sided triangle. How do we know that a contradiction doesn't arise in the concept of God, especially when we can't really think about God fully? None of us have a perfect vision of God, finite as we are in this side of the grave. That is something the church actually does teach, that we don't have the beatific vision or the full vision of God this side of the grave, just as a side note there. <laughs> so can anybody think of a proof as to why God is possible? And when you're trying to think of something, when you're trying to think of a proof of something that you haven't thought of before, one of the best ways to go about doing it is to simply analyze the terms of the questions. So if you're saying something like, I'm trying to look for a proof that God is possible. Analyze what God means. In this case, that in which none greater can be conceived or that in which none greater is possible. Uh, think of what impossible means and what possibility means. And then when you've analyzed those terms, you might actually have the answer simply by analyzing what the meaning of that question really is. So I particularly analyze what does possibility mean? We use it all the time, so we use it meaningfully. We sort of, you might say, implicitly know it or use it as a judgment. So what does possibility mean? That can happen. No, I'm, I'm pointing at you because you had your hand up. <coughs> so I would say they, that they have to prove the negative. They have to negate this through, through the neg negation, right? So the question is, do they have to prove a negative? And do you mean who do you mean by they? I mean, Khan has to prove that. Doesn't he have to prove that God's not possible? Uh, so the question is, does Kant have to prove that God is not possible? No, Kant isn't actually claiming. He isn't claiming that God is impossible, so he's not positively making that claim. He's simply pointing out that without proof of number one, we can see, or, or rather, I guess this would be a better way of pointing out, Kant is pointing out how weak one is if we don't have a proof that God is possible. We quickly often will say something is possible without fully analyzing what possibility means. In, in fact, a good example of that is that unicorn in this room. Initially, a lot of us would want to say, oh, it's possible, it's just not going to happen. It's possible, hypothetically, that there's a unicorn in this room, 
without realizing the actual logical impossibility of it when one analyzes the meaning this room and unicorn. Uh, so Wait, you don't see the unicorn? No. <laughs> <laughs> All on the assumption that this room actually doesn't contain a unicorn. Uh, but you aren't here, and there could be one here. No. Okay. So possibility. Possibility. That which could happen? Yep. How does an impossibility happen? How does the opposite of possibility happen? Because if we can negate, if we can get rid of the opposite of possibility, then by double negation, we prove possibility. In other words, if we prove that all conditions of impossibility do not apply here, then God would be necessarily possible. Well, mathematically, I'm thinking any, what's undefined would be something over zero. Uh, so the statement was uh, something undefined is over zero. So in mathematics, uh, a number divided by zero is undefined. Okay. So that, and that idea would be that the denominator is nothing. The denominator is nothing. Non-existent, in other words. Non-existent. So since we know there is existence, the denominator is not zero. Right. So, that's, so, so the statement is, since we know there's existence, the denominator can't be the case? The denominator can't be zero, and that's the only situation where you would have undefined, which is impossible. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I'm going along with what you're saying, but my, my thought, and you don't like it, I already know you don't <laughs> like it, which is, I see creation. And I can't, there is no explanation to me other than God for the creation. Right. And which is kind of the same thing, I, at least I took it the same thing as what you said. That you can't, you can't have nothing. something out of nothing. Right. It's because we know we have creation, so you're starting from something in the numerator. Right. So the, the so statement is maybe way. there isn't a possible. Maybe God is possible because of creation. Creation has to have a creator, and creation is obviously possible, therefore God is possible. Uh, so then you would go into a whole argument of using the cosmological proof for God's existence to prove that God is possible. Interestingly enough, though, just as a side note, Kant demonstrates, to my satisfaction at least, but a whole other thing entirely, uh, that the cosmological argument, and in fact all proofs for God's existence, actually rest on this proof of God's existence. Interestingly enough, that they're contained in those arguments. Well, we can discuss that another time with that. How can you so, come to an impossibility? Yeah, exactly. That's the question. It's How do we come to an impossibility? Under no circumstances ever. Period. Correct. Could, well, then couldn't you counter it with the argument that God might be possible? Argument that God might be impossible. So the statement, could you counter this with the idea that God might be possible? This is actually famously done by uh, blessed Dun Scotus. Scotus recognizes the same problem. In fact, this problem was uh, explicitly identified probably first by Dun Scotus. Arguably Aquinas does so as well. But Dun Scotus points out this weakness of the ontological argument. And his response is, uh, we cannot prove, at least he thought, we cannot prove that God is possible, but we have a lot of evidence that God is possible. Namely, the idea of the infinite is one that doesn't bring immediate dissatisfaction to the intellect doesn't bring immediate dissatisfaction to the intellect like most contradictory things do. And this would be a sign, he would say, that it's possible. Likewise, it seems to be the foundation of all thought. All thought seems to contain this idea of the infinite or the is. And if we reject it as possible, then it seems like we reject the possibility of all things. So Kant would, or sorry, Scotus would point to the idea that well, although we might not be able to prove God is possible, it certainly seems like there's a decent amount of evidence to think he is possible, and if he is possible, the argument certainly follows. So that would be his claim. But it's not a full proof, 
Kant still, Kant still has something there that God, well, God still might be impossible. It's not certainly not certain just because of those things that it follows. And it has nothing to do with the fact that if something is impossible, you can't put might with it anyway. Well, but he's right. saying God might be impossible, to which I would argue, but God might be possible. Correct. Correct. I, I'm using the same like right. anything that might be po- impossible. But how does a just... four-sided triangle. So the question is, can anything actually be impossible? So anything that's contradictory would be an example of something that's impossible. So a four-sided triangle is impossible. Yeah. Okay, so okay. Now, what does that tell you? Why? Why is a four-sided triangle impossible? And what is the problem with the country? What's the problem with the four sidedness? It's not a triangle because it's not doesn't try. Have, it's not three. It doesn't have three angles. So there's a conflict of sort. With the word, with the actual what it is. Or the right? meaning. Yeah. yeah. There's a conflict in the meaning. How does that conflict happen? So we could say the meaning of God. Well, well I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> So the meaning of God is infinite. The meaning of God is infinite. So something is impossible, and here here we'll go go on with this answer. This is Leibniz's answer, one of the co-founders of calculus. Recent historical studies are pretty well indicating that he didn't plagiarize uh, Sir Isaac Newton, but rather they contemporaneously discovered calculus. Leibniz... Leibniz asks us the question, well, what makes something impossible? Impossibility arises only because of a conflict of limits. Three-sidedness is limited from being four-sidedness and all other sidedness rather than three. It has an intrinsic limit that will Mm -hmm. conflict. Anything that you can think of has a potential limit. Anything that you can think of has a potential limit besides that which is limitless. So, Leibniz points out that God, by definition, we're referring to the infinite. In other words, impossibility is impossible because there's no possibility of the conflict of limits. No contradiction could arise in the meaning of God because all contradiction requires a conflict of limit. Kant, the last statement that Kant has in the Critique of Pure Reason on the ontological argument is an attempt to address Leibniz's statement here. And Kant says, now hold on now. Yeah, you think, you think you're saving the argument from this criticism uh, that, you know, you say God is without limit, but really that's only conceptual. And pure ideas say nothing about reality. In other words, the second objection. Pure reason says nothing about reality. It's like, so, okay, Leibniz, you've proven through logic that God is necessarily possible. But that's purely logical. And we know that nothing that's purely logical says anything about reality. It has to be connected to the senses in some way. That is, all real properties are ones that are informed by, and I say, quote, sense experience too. And I put sense experience in quotation because Kant's actually not even presupposing that we have noumena or real bodies. He's simply pointing out that we have this experience and that part of that experience can't be explained internally. It has to be explained externally. But we, for simplicity, we'll say, Everything that is real has to be informed by sense experience. Pure reasoning, I think this is in the title of this work that we're talking about, the critique of pure reasoning. Pure reasoning devoid of experience, logically this is often called a priori reasoning, which simply means uh, before. Prior is where you get the word prior from, so before, uh, before experience. Reasoning devoid of experience, however logically necessary, says nothing necessary about reality itself. It's just a relation of ideas that are purely in the subjective mind. You know, think here of Hume's fork, if you know what it is, relation of ideas and the real world. This is part 
a little bit of what he's retained from Hume's fork, even while trying to solve it a little bit. Kant says, and I'm here I'm going to actually quote him, he says, every reasonable person must confess that every existential proposition is synthetical. Now, what does he mean by that, with these terms like synthetical? He simply means that uh, every existential, every statement about <laughs> reality has to come not just from the relation of ideas, not just from the looking of ideas that we already have, they have to come from ideas that we don't have already. They have to come from ideas that are coming from the outside, because we're going to talk about the outside, it has to come from the outside. And all our logical thoughts are purely internal. They're purely internal. He also states that if pure a priori ideas perfectly correspond to reality, then that means tautologies would all be true about reality. Because all tautologies are pure ideas that are necessarily true. But that's absurd. It's absurd, Kant would say. Uh, now, what's a tautology? If you haven't heard of that terminology before. It simply means like something like A equals A. A equals A. Or the thing equals itself. It's the principle of identity, basically. <coughs> and so you could just say, well, God exists, therefore God exists, is basically what he's saying. He said, that's absurd. To claim that tautologies are true about reality and are not just a pure relation of ideas, that's absolutely absurd. Basically, he says, pure reasoning, to sum it all up, Purely reasoning something is real doesn't mean it's real. Simply because you're thinking that God is real and can't think otherwise doesn't actually mean that God is real. So where would we put this criticism in the argument? What premise is he criticizing or is he criticizing a premise? <laughs> wow. So possible answers are one, two, and three. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> All of the above, possibly. So one, one seems ruled out. He's not denying that that in which none greater can be conceived is an idea. In fact, he's actually saying, well, let's presume it is an idea. In fact, he says, presuming it is possible, uh, it's just an idea. That's all it is. Uh, and when you're predicating existence there, you're, you, you aren't doing it synthetically. You're just doing it with relations of ideas. Uh, two, he's not really criticizing that existence is more or less in this particular criticism right here. Uh, and then three, he doesn't seem to be addressed. But it looks like he's doing. He's basically just saying you can't do this. In other words, a... Criticism of the argument, attack, or attacking the conclusion of the argument, which, again, is not a valid way to go about criticizing an argument because it's basically a rejection of logic. That's exactly what he's doing, actually. You see, there are some problems there. What does this criticism look like out of ones that we saw already with Thomas Aquinas? Yeah, thinking does not mean it's true. That last one right there. Exact same criticism with a lot more wording and a lot more sophisticated way of going about doing it. So with these criticisms, with this particular criticism, pure reason says nothing about reality to kind of sum these all up, how would we respond? Now, can you think of anything on your own? Think of any ways you might respond to this argument besides, I mean, obviously there's that one of it's an argument against the conclusion. And really that's not a valid way of going about attacking an argument. You can't just say, nah, -uh, you know, <laughs> to, the, to the argument working. And is he saying that reason is subjective? Kind of. Yeah. In fact, that, that seems exactly what he's saying in... in in clever wording, but he seems to be saying, but pure reasoning. So he's not necessarily saying that reasoning when you add sensory data is wrong. It's just saying pure reasoning itself is subjective. What might be a problem with that, though? Even if we say that when we introduce sensory stuff, then, well, it becomes something that would get us somewhere. 
Yeah, it's reason, it uses reason also. Yeah, that is one of the major criticisms of Kant by most academics. This criticism of his criticism of the ontological argument is also a criticism against his entire system of philosophy. Basically, let's assume, and there's various ways of going about criticizing this, but let's assume that all true statements about reality must be derived in some way from sense experience, or just we might call it sense, or we might call it experience, which for him uh, contains both the subjective a priori form and the sensory data. How is that derived? How is that claim derived? Is that claim derived from uh, experience through the senses, even when we consider such a priori forms as spatio-temporal conditions? Uh-uh. No. And if nothing is true that doesn't come from the senses, if it's just purely subjective, then that claim is purely subjective and doesn't apply to reality. Even if you did claim, even if you did claim that maybe it was in some way derived, we just can't figure it out, is the argument used to prove that coming from relation of ideas, or is it coming from the senses? Relation of ideas. In other words, if it's true, it's false, or rather a better way of putting it, if it's true, it's only subjectively true. And it says nothing about reality, which it claims to claim about reality. In other words, it's self-refuting. Now, what about that other claim where he scoffs at what he calls miserable tautologies? Now, on the surface, and there's a lot of reasons why we might say this, and I, I won't go into them in detail right now, uh, kind of because we bought in, I think, as a society to Aristotelian and kind of post-Kantian criticisms of reason. But why is it that we would make a claim that... Tally? In fact, it seems to me the opposite is the absurdity. A is A is A. If you deny A is A, it seems like you deny the most basic principle of all logic. But more to the point, and something I don't think we think about too often, every logical argument is actually a tautology. Ultimately, every logical argument is actually a tautology, including Kant's arguments right here are tautological. Because if the conclusion is not contained in the premises that are above the conclusion, the conclusion will not follow. All a conclusion is, is identifying the relationship of the ideas in the premises and identifying how they are there once you make those assumptions. In other words, all logic can be reduced to A equals A, pretty much. When you reduce all those premises down, if you have a valid argument, you have a tautological argument. So if tautologies do not apply to reality, then logic does not apply to reality, but this is actually exactly what Kant says. Kant is kind of fine with this. If one says logic applies to reality, but only if a premise is derived empirically, uh, so if you try and reject that with that, then we're back at the same thing, namely that it would be inapplicable to reality because it cannot be derived empirically, that a premise must be derived empirically, and you use logic to get there. And if logic is empty and inapplicable to reality, then we're stuck completely in the mind with the subjective forms that inform all our reasoning to which we cannot compare to reality because all we have access to is experience and the relation of ideas. But that's actually, Kant is actually okay with it. That's his system. He says you can't get out of your mind. And he says there's no re reason to relate ideas to reality. The problem again with that is that is self-refuting. You can't actually conceive that because it's a claim about reality. In other words, you're making the contradiction, basically to sum it all up, you're making the contradiction that about reality you can say nothing, <laughs> which is a claim about reality. <laughs> so it's self-refuting. <laughs> Uh, and I would challenge that Kant's whole system is self-refuting. And I have not met a Kantian who can get me around that one. Uh, if they're out there, I'd love to talk with them. There's been a couple of dicks. Uh, 
<laughs> some smart defense attorney asked me, isn't it possible? And I'm going to have to smile and not know how to answer or simply say, no, it's not. <laughs> he was drunk. <laughs> So, so the statement was like in law, you're going to have a defense attorney who say, isn't it possible uh, for X, Y, Z? This is actually something I used in my closing <laughs> arguments coming from, believe it or not, part of my closing arguments have something from the ontological argument in it, dealing with the criticisms of the ontological argument. One of the things I would say about reasonable doubt is I'd point out to the jury that anything is possible logically, anything. By anything, I mean anything that's non-contradictory is logically possible. Is it possible that there are aliens on Mars? Extremely unlikely. In fact, it's so unlikely you'd probably be a crazy person to say there were. But logically, it's possible. Because we do not know everything. The defense strategy was typically to always point to the many possibilities there were. But not reasonable possibilities. And there was the difference. And it was reasonable doubt, not doubt per se. Because any possibility gives rise to doubt. But it, is it reasonable? And that's, that's the frame of argument that I'd go along. Because you, you have this thing with defense attorneys, especially when they don't have a real good defense. The best thing they can do is try and confuse the jury and then make them confuse their confusion, of, which causes doubt, with reasonable <laughs> doubt. And so always trying to clear that is a very important thing uh, for an attorney who's dealing with any defense attorney who's even slightly worth their pay. So uh, pure reasoning does not mean it is real. If pure reasoning does not mean it real, then we can derive nothing real for it. All truth claims are derived, at least in part, from reason. And so always distinct from reality in that way. And if there's any distinction between them and all we have access to is uh, understanding of truth claims through reason, then we can say absolutely nothing about reality because we aren't even in a position to compare raw external reality with the internal framework that's already structured by these a priori forms and pure reasoning. And finally, uh, even with all that aside, it's just an invalid way of attacking an argument. You can't attack an argument through its conclusion right there. So, in summary, this is, I would say, is a sophistic, and I don't mean that in a positive way, sophistic in the kind of platonic sense of the sophist, it's sophistry. So even though sophistry means wisdom pretty much, in this case it means basically you're using word games uh, that are actually inherently contradictory uh, to confuse people and get to a point, which is really just that A doesn't equal A. It's really A doesn't equal A. And if you go back, you can see how the ontological argument is so associated with epistemology. It's so associated with proper thinking because this is the empiricist problem all over again. Once you assume there's a distinction between mind and reality, I'm talking about true content of mind. We often call beliefs content of mind. No, those are actions of will. And most of our life is within this action of will, of belief. But true content of awareness, if it is distinct from the reality that it claims to be, then you are inherently going to be committing a self-contradiction. You cannot get around that idea that once you separate the mind from reality, you can say nothing about reality, including the claim that they are separate. You can say absolutely nothing about reality. So it's self-refuting. And it's not surprising that it's self-refuting when it's a rejection of tautology, when it's a rejection of the principle of identity. You'll see this in many different forms. Uh, this is still somewhat of a prevailing philosophy. It's dying out. But you'll still uh, see people talk about how tautologies are just relations of ideas. They don't really mean anything uh, without going more in depth than that. But it's basically a rejection of the most fundamental principle of rationality, namely the principle of identity. So let's turn to his most famous criticism of all. This one, so he makes several criticisms. He makes a prong attack 
on this argument. And several of his criticisms on their own are sufficient to refute the ontological argument if they are true. So even though we've rejected these other ones, we need to look at this one too. And this one is, is his most famous one, though I think often misunderstood what he means. Well, what he means is actually quite clever. Uh, what most people think he means is, uh, honestly, I, I'm not impressed at all. But, but his particular criticism is quite powerful. Now let's see if it works or not. So his criticism is that existence is not a real predicate. And that's very important, this qualifier of what he means here. He's not outright denying that existence is a predicate. And by predicate, I just mean property, right? In fact, Kant himself will say, yes, you can predicate it logically. You can predicate it through logic. In fact, that's the only way we can predicate it because it's not a real property. And what, is, what might he mean by a real property? It's not, it's not uh, it doesn't add content. It's simply a copula. It's something that connects two real predicates. Rather, it's a logical predicate. And so what does he mean by that? It's only relational. It connects subject to predicate or real object to concept. It's empty on its own. On its own, it's empty. So you can predicate it logically, but you can't actually give it to the concept itself. So having it doesn't make the thing greater or lesser because it's simply relational and empty on its own. So here's the example he gives. He says, $100, think of $100 in your pocket. It's not actually dollars, it's, uh, I forget the name of the the Danish currency, but uh, think of $100 in your pocket versus the idea of uh, $100 in your pocket. So actually $100 in your pocket versus the possibility, the concept of $100 in your pocket. You'll notice in both of those conceptions, you can't think of existence. What does that look like? What does the existence look like that distinguishes those two things? There's nothing. It's simply a judgment, Kant says. We use it as a principle of judgment to connect the content of the concept to an object of experience. I say this X is or exists as $100. In other words... It exists as a mere relational copula. It connects two things together. But on its own, it's meaningless because it simply means to connect those two things. And the thought experiment is that to, to show that you don't really have any actual concept. You just use it as a logical judgment to relate ideas together. So... If it were a real predicate, and here's another issue with it, let's assume it actually were a real predicate that added to something to the concept, that made the concept greater. If you affirmed it of something that we assumed lacked it, we would contradict ourselves in saying it existed. So think of the argument. We assume God doesn't exist. We're assuming that that which is greater can be conceived doesn't exist. But then we say, we assume it exists, and see that it's greater than it was. But that's a contradiction. We're assuming the non-existent thing is existent. That's a contradiction. We can't do that. There's a contradiction in the argument. So those are the two parts of the statement of existence is not a real predicate. And we'll get into the really bad version of it later. Uh, that most, that if you ever hear anybody quote Kant, they're probably going to give you the kind of pseudo-Kant version. So this would go to... Premises two and three. Two would be a criticism that something is actually greater because it has more existence. There's no such thing as having more existence, or it's just more relation at best. But we look at number three here, and we don't actually see the problem in the way this argument is formulated. I will say Ansem's language actually does commit the error that Kant is talking about, and this is how Ansem formulates it. He formulates it as that in which none greater can be thought uh, of, can be thought of as existing in reality. 
But that's already denied by the assumption because we can't think of a contradiction. But we just reword it as something with all the qualities with it and then you avoid this problem altogether. <coughs> so that second criticism doesn't really work uh, for a well-formulated ontological argument. But that first one's a doozy. Um, and so how might we address it? Can we address something like this? I tell you, this criticism of Kant, this, this better understood version of Kant's criticism taken from the critique of pure reason, I think is very powerful. And it took me a long time thinking through this. I think you might guess what my uh, position will be, but uh, I will say this, this takes a lot of thinking through. Ian, can you go back to that previous slide? This one? Yeah, I made you sit here and think about it. All right. Well, you, you got that. You got that. Uh. So, guys, we're skipping four. Four. So, uh, existence is not a predicate? No, no, this is. Existence is not a real predicate. That's, that's C. That's three. Three. Yeah, we'll get to 3A. We'll get to 3A. That's the pseudo-Kant, I would say. So the question was, we're skipping the existence is not a predicate. We're still on existence is not a real predicate. And I say, we will get to existence is uh, okay, not a predicate. saying it's not as good an argument as you think. It's not. So the last one, unfortunately, is not. This is, I would say this is Kant's best criticism of the ontological argument. It's also, at least in name, people will cite this, even if they don't understand it, this, uh, at least in name, is the most famous criticism of the ontological argument that there is. Surprisingly, Aquinas actually made the same argument before Kant. <laughs> so Aquinas really should get the credit here. But they're very similar thinkers, and I, I think there's good reason to think that the transcendental, that's all side stuff, but I think there's good reason to think the transcendental Thomas have Thomas right, but that's me. So that claim that existence has no meaning outside of a relationship of two things. So two things can exist without existence? That is true, but, but he would say, yeah, without that copula, that's the copula that indicates <coughs> that, that the concept <coughs> has a place in reality. It's the connection between the concept and the thing itself. So, when we talk about something having no meaning outside of a relationship, does that make much sense that on its own would have no meaning? If it's meaningless on its own, then how do we give the meaningless meaning? Is that even reasonable to say? I don't think so. But here are several issues. Uh, that last one there at the bottom we want to address because we already addressed it. So it's not a problem as we wrote the argument. Uh, premise three doesn't contradict the assumption as we wrote the argument. But I think the foremost issue is nothing can be meaningless on its own, but then suddenly have it by relationship. For something meaningless has no meaning to modify. It literally means nothing if it's meaningless. The same meaninglessness means the same thing as nothing. And nothing doesn't become something because there's nothing there to modify. So is in that copula, as a copula, must have a reasonable meaning of some sort in order to form the relationship in the first place. Otherwise, you're joining the two things with nothing or with meaninglessness. But no, if it forms a relationship, it's forming some meaning. <clears throat> 
Even if we did suppose that is were merely denoting a relationship, like Kant says, it's a type of relationship. For there are many different types of relations, the least of which would be its opposite, which is literally nothing, that they don't relate. Or their relationship is one of contradiction, maybe. So there's different types of relationships. Now, what does that mean? If there's different types of relationships, then you have to figure out which type it is. But anything that is a type of some genus, anything that's a type of something broader, is not that broader thing. Otherwise, it would mean the same thing as the broader thing. So by being a type, it has an independent meaning of relationship itself. In other words, there's at least an aspect of the meaning of is that has nothing to do with relationship. Otherwise, again, it would mean the exact same thing as relationship. So by being a type, we have to identify what type of relationship it is. Uh, so you can think of it, for instance, even when you start to get types of relationships, you have to further qualify. So let's say you have a relationship of height. We well, have to further qualify what type of relationship of height are we talking about. But height itself is not relational. It simply means verticality. Uh, whether it's short verticality or tall verticality is the relational aspect of it. But it has a meaning on its own. But even more interestingly, if you analyze what that meaning is, hidden behind the claim that it's a pure relation, when you realize that it's not just relational, but a type of relation, and ask yourself the question of what type of relation it is, it's an existential relationship. In other words, you have to first understand what existential or existence means before you use it as a... So we're back to it being a predicate. In other words, you have to be able to predicate the type of relationship to relationship to make sense of the relationship. Well, not empty predicate. In other words, existence most definitely is a predicate. Otherwise, this relation would be any type of relation, but it's not because there are other types of relations that it could have, namely relations of negation, contraposition. There's many different types of relationships we could have there. So when we analyze it, we understand that it's a relationship of existence, of isness. Uh, you might say identity. All those things mean the same thing, or reality, or the affirmation of the concept. All those things mean the same. Positivity, whatever you want to say. All those words mean the same thing. So to say that is, uh, here's another criticism. To say that is is limited to anything is to say that is is not in some way, which is the height of illogical or irrationality. It's a, it's a pure contradiction. So to say that is is limited to a particular type of relationship is to negate something about is, which is contradictory logically. And finally, we might also point out, we look at, oops, we look at the argument, we can see that Anselm really doesn't talk about existence. He talks about in re and in intellectu, or in reality and in the mind. Kant also addresses in the intellect and in the mind in a, in a certain way, but it's not clearly a direct criticism of Anselmian logic there. But if any one of those criticisms of the criticism stands, if any one of those you find convincing, it means that criticism of Kant is unconvincing. And I think it's pretty clear, I think that first one, when something cannot have meaning on its, uh, if something has no meaning on its own, then it can form no type of relationship with anything. <coughs> so, so much for that one. But does anybody have any, any uh, arguments against that potentially? Language either. So you're using language 
true, can't use the, can't use the sentence. Right. So the statement is, if existence is not a real predicate, it seems like that's language, or actually logic, so you couldn't even use logic in the first place. I would say that's probably true, and uh, I'd say this is probably related in some ways to the last criticism Kant made. Yeah, I think there's probably some truth there. So let's look at the argument as it's famously known. I'll say this is pseudo-Kant, because... I am very convinced in my reading of the Critique of Pure Reason that this is not Kant. Uh, I particularly think it's not Kant because of how foolish I think this argument is. But this is often what you'll hear when you hear Kant's criticism of the ontological argument. And honestly, if these people just thought twice about it, I, I don't think they would find this convincing at all. I think people who hold to this are eager to find that the argument is wrong and misunderstand Kant at that. Yeah, but enough of my criticism of them. So, there's a claim that Kant says existence is not a predicate pure and simple. He uses that language for sure, but he clarifies that uh, existence can be a logical predicate and is a copula. And they'll point out the statement, well, you can think of existence in everything, so it doesn't add anything to a concept. So it's meaningless because it, it's in everything, or rather it's in a sense in nothing because it's in everything. And then they take the example Kant did and twist it a little bit. They say, uh, take the example of $100 in your pocket and $100 in concept. Whether or not that $100 exists in your pocket or in concept, that concept of the $100 itself in your pocket is the exact same thing, right? So it's just, it's just that $100 that you're connecting, you know, in possibility or existence. You take away the question of existence, you remove existence from it, and you don't ask the question whether it exists or not exists. You're still dealing with the same thing, $100 in your pocket. So I'd say this is very, very clearly a bad criticism. There is clearly a meaningful difference between existence and non-existence. It's perhaps the most meaningful statement you can make about anything, and you can make non-existent claims. Furthermore, it becomes even more obvious when you talk about necessity and contingency, or partial existence and full existence. For instance, the screen that you're looking at right there exists right there, but not to the side, so it's lacking some existence, and that's different from something that is pure existence, that has no lack whatsoever. But you can think of all these different things where existence definitely adds meaning, and it's probably the most meaningful thing, again, that you can say about something. So the claim that existence has no meaning is to deny that there's any difference between the claim that exists and that doesn't exist. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, that's a very bad argument. You'll, you'll hear people say that. Uh, as far as that twisting of Kant's example goes, well, you can pull that same trick with any predicate, right? So take the $100 in your pocket. Here's, here's a twist on it. Take $100 in your pocket. Now remove the idea of in your pocket from the $100. It's still the same $100. So in your pocket's not a predicate. Now, obviously it is a predicate. So very, very, very poor logic there and definitely not to be attributed to Kant. So with all those things aside, with the criticisms aside, if we have indeed addressed the criticisms, I'm very convinced of it, we go back to something that Kant criticized in the very beginning, which we didn't really address, uh, to which he thinks his criticisms address. But we're back there at square one again if those criticisms don't work. And I would say, ask this question again that I asked at the end of the last session uh, on the ontological argument. Can we any more deny the existence of existence than we can three-sidedness from triangle? And again, immediately this isn't going to appear like a proof of God's existence. This is a simple version of the ontological argument, and I think a very pure and working one. 
when we analyze the meaning of existence, we come up with interesting things. It turns out that the meaning of the word existence is why it's so aptly called an ontological argument, which actually Kant came up with that terminology. Onto means being in Greek. Can we deny existence exists any more than we can deny that a triangle has four sides? And then when we examine, again, going back to that slide on what God means or that in which none greater can be conceived means, when we think of existence, we note various interesting things. Existence means that which is, or it means reality, something like that. But we note with all finite things that they're lacking in some way this meaning. I look at myself, or I look at this slide up here, and I notice it exists there, but doesn't exist somewhere else. And so it's lacking in some existence. Anytime something is not, then it is the opposite of that which is in some way. And everything, therefore, that has a limit is in some way non-existent. So existence means I am who am, or is who is or simply is. That's what existence means, as God revealed his name in the Old Testament to Moses. And a mere analysis of one of those most simple terms and thought reveals that this basically all people would call this God when they analyze the meaning of it. But can we deny the existence of existence any more than a triangle has three sides? And I think the argument the ontological argument simply comes down to the first principle of all logic, namely that A is A, or existence is existence. I want to make a claim even more radical than that that I made last time. I want to claim that it is the most irrational proposition possible to deny that existence is existence the most irrational principle possible. Let's examine that. Irrationality, what does that mean? What does irrationality mean? Something against reason, something against truth. What's the most basic principle of all reasoning? Something that it, yeah, yeah. Identity, right? So. Even the principle of non-contradiction relies on the principle of identity, which is simply that A is A. Simply that A is A. Now, what is more contradictory than a denial of the principle of identity? Or what, sorry, what is more irrational than a denial of the principle of identity? I can't think of any higher principles of logic than the principle of identity. Now, what's more, so that's one thing, rejecting the principle of identity is a rejection of the ontological argument, I would say, or its most basic form. But what's the most irrational way to reject the principle of identity? I think using the mere copula, as Kant would call it, the thing that you use to do the principle of identity as your subject as well. So is equals not is. I think that's the most irrational thing. And why would I say that? Consider its exact opposite as a tautology. Consider its exact opposite in the principle of identity. Nothing is nothing. Does that entirely make sense, though? Because what does is mean? It means existence. Nothing exists as nothing. Does nothing do anything at all? No. No. It certainly doesn't exist. So although we use that in a logical relationship, understanding nothing through this concept of is, the exact opposite of it seems far less rational or is far less irrational than rejecting that is is. Now then think of anything in between nothing and is. If I deny my existence, Ben is not Ben. There are some ways that I am not. And so rejection of existence of me isn't entirely absurd in the same way that rejection of the uh, principle of identity with nothing isn't as absurd as the rejection of is, is, is. So I like to claim here 
that the ontological argument is no more than the principle of identity, the highest principle of all reasoning, and that its rejection in any form, before you even deal with the criticism of the ontological argument, any rejection of the ontological argument is a rejection of the most basic principle of all reasoning, and so should be rejected out of hand before you even deal with it. It's a rejection of the love of reason. And that's all.